Good morning. Great to see you. If you've ever worried that you don't have all the answers, or maybe you realized, uh uh-oh, I thought I knew all the answers, I don't know what to do, I don't know the next step, then you're in the right place. Our first hymn allows us to see who's guiding us. Let's stand as we sing, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Aren't you glad you don't have to have all the answers? Let's uh, be guided by the great Jehovah. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Feed me till I want no more. Open now the crystal fountain whence the healing waters flow. Let the fire and cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong, strong deliverer, be Thou still my strength and shield, be thou still my strength and shield. On the last, when I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fears subside. Bear me through the swelling current, land me safe on Canaan's side. Songs and praises, songs and praises, I will ever give to Thee. I will ever give to Thee. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. Good singing this morning. We'll continue to lift up our Lord and His name this morning throughout the service. And uh, looking forward to that. I appreciate the uh, start and Sunday school time, looking at God's Word and moving into our morning worship service as well. It's good to see Darlene Warsham with us as well. Praising the Lord, she's able to to be out and um, just for strength and healing continually. And um, good to see you, sister. Let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to uh, just work in our service this morning, and then we'll continue in song. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for the opportunity we have this morning to come and to meet with other believers in common, and Lord, for the purpose of lifting up your name, learning of you, worshiping you, and Lord, I pray that this morning everything that we do and say would be pleasing in your eyes as we fellowship, as we Um, love one another as we sing, as we give, as we pray, as we take your word and and, uh, don't just uh, be hearers to it, but are doers to it as well. All of these things, Lord, we pray would be pleasing to you this morning as we spend time worshiping you. And uh, Lord, do a work in our hearts. And as we continue to study through uh, this passage in Matthew this morning, I pray you would give me the words to say, Lord, that you would challenge our hearts and our Christian walk in areas that you see fit. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Scripture teaches that uh, you reap what you sow and God blesses those who uh, follow him. And sometimes we can maybe get a wrong perspective of that and think that, well, if we're doing what's right or we're loving the Lord, nothing bad ever happens. <laughs> we ever been tempted to think that? Um, yeah, and yet uh, we realize we're in a fallen world. Um, saved and unsaved get sick. Saved and unsaved lose loved ones. Saved and unsaved have car wrecks and things unexpected. And yet God's faithful in the midst of those. Even if we're in the middle of his will, we can face some of those challenges and see his faithfulness. And this weekend, Bible class in the junior high, 7th uh, through ninth Bible class, we were talking about Joseph and how God gave him these awesome promises. And then tragedy after tragedy after impossible circumstance happened to him. But he was right in the middle of God's will. Isn't that comforting to us? Um, that's an encouragement to me to realize, um, you know what? It's okay. Uh, and the, the passage kept saying, and God was with Joseph. 
And so in the middle of our trials, let's remember that. And our next hymn will encourage us to bring our burdens to the Lord. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. We can take each one of these needs to our Lord. Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today. Leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Troubled soul, the Savior can see every heartache and tear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. That's great. Let's continue our good singing this morning as we stand and sing Bow the Knee. This hymn speaks of a humble spirit before the Lord and recognizing him as our creator and our father. Two verses to this new hymn. What a privilege to come into God's presence Just to linger with the one who set me free As I lift my eyes and see his awesome glory I remember who he is and bow the knee Bow the knee, bow the knee he is king of all the ages, bow the knee. God alone on his throne, see him high and lifted up and bow the knee. Kneel before him, all adore him, as you live to love him more, bow the knee. In his hand he holds the power of creation. With his voice he spoke and all things came to be. Yet he hears each simple prayer I bring before him. When I humbly seek his face and bow the knee. Bow the knee, bow the knee. He is king of all the ages, bow the knee. God alone on his throne, see him high and lifted up and bow the knee. Kneel before him, all adore him, as you live to love him more, bow the knee. Thank you. You can be seated. All right. If you take out your bulletins this morning, you'll see several opportunities and details of things coming up. 
And uh, just a reminder for those who are members here at Eagle Heights that the deacon nomination forms our due today, and so we can move forward after today in a prayerful way with the next steps in that process. We kind of just put today as a date, and so um, today is still time to turn that in, and I really appreciate everybody pray, praying through this process. That's what we want. We want the Lord's will and, uh, and everything, and so we'll continue to do that uh, today and moving forward. Uh, in, in a few weeks, we do have a ministry team that will be with us. Southland ministry team is a uh, evangelistic team that's sent out of Southland Christian Camp. And uh, Brother Mike Herbster's son, I believe, is kind of heading up that team. And so they are uh, traveling to churches throughout the year. And so they'll be with us on Sunday, October 8th. And then they'll also um, they'll be leaving the area for a little bit, but back in the area later that week. And so we're going to have uh, them in chapel in the school as well. But it's moved from the normal chapel time. You can see that from Thursday to Friday um, when they are here on October 13th. And then we do have uh, Brother Steve Hustis uh, that will be with us the Wednesday before October 8th, and I believe that's October 5th or 4th, something like that, and so uh, he'll be with us on a Wednesday evening and then speaking in chapel that same week, and so we're looking forward uh, to having him back in the area for a little bit and reuniting and catching up with him as well. And then just if you look over to your right side, you see some upcoming events. I did just want to let you know that September 26th volleyball game has been um, for now moved, and so there will not be a game on the 26th. And you can the other things look um, like they are still on schedule for that. Later on in October, we are going to have our fall festival, our time with kind of a bonfire and fellowship. So that's on October 20th, and we're going to get the details out soon. Um, and I think that some of it's already getting out, and so appreciate um, all the uh, help towards that. It's a great activity and time of fellowship. The teenagers have an activity coming up as well in a couple of weeks, so Pastor Tom is um, working on that with them, and so just be aware of that on October 7th, there's a teen activity at 5 p.m. as well. All right, men, if you want to come forward this morning, I'll give back to the Lord in our tithes and offering. And, um, oh, another thing that I did want to announce, uh, a few things, is to be in prayer for one another. Um, pray for the Gordons this morning. They've got some sickness in the house, and Miss Barra is traveling, some others as well. So think about them today and pray for them, and I can't wait to have them back with us. Let's pray. Ask the Lord to uh, do a work in our service and, and uh, bless this offering as well. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for providing for us. Lord, you are the giver of all good things, and we, we understand that this morning. Help us to give back to you with hearts of love and cheerfulness. And this morning, we pray that you would take our tithes and offering, Lord, and with that and with our giving back to you, that you would just continue to use us as tools and vessels in your hand here at Eagle Heights for your ministry, for your gospel, and for your glory. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Pam. That was beautiful. Brought our hearts and our minds to the Lord. And just to plug in for tonight as well, I believe the teenagers are singing. So if you're not excited about Leviticus, maybe come back for that tonight, all right? That'll be this evening in the evening service. Matthew chapter 5 with me this morning as we continue this series that we began last week on the Sermon on the Mount. This is the um, series that we are working through, which is Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7. Last week was um, not just introduction, we gave some context to this sermon But we also started with what was known as the Beatitudes. We worked our way through verse 12, and that can be a a very lengthy study in and of itself. I'd encourage you to study them in depth on your own time. And uh, for the sake of this study, we're just kind of moving through and working through them together. And we'll continue to do that. And so on Sunday mornings here for the foreseeable future, we get to encounter the greatest sermon um, ever preached. And we're going to do that together as Christ preached this message on, on a hill outside of Capernaum and spoke to his disciples. The master preacher, he began his teaching by beautifully and in the, the Greek language poetically describing kingdom citizens or those who are in Christ by referring to their nature and what they also ought to be and by reminding them of the blessing or the happiness there is when you are a kingdom citizen in the section that we call the Beatitudes. All right, so once again, as we come back to verse 13 now, imagine the setting with me as we come to this scene and this sermon. The Creator God Jesus Christ in human form looks at his own creation, correct? Mankind, limited in our understanding, fallen in our understanding of life and of life in Christ, what it means to be in Christ. And if we're any of us, we may think, wow, how can I relate these perfect truths? to these limited capacities of understanding. It may take time for us to come up with something, but not our God. Not only were and are His teachings perfect, but He knew exactly how to bring these eternal truths to the understanding of those listening. And at this point in His sermon, He moves on from His poetry now to what also resonates when uh, you and I here teachers teach, something called metaphors. Metaphors are great when helping explain a concept to someone. A metaphor is something like a figure of speech that describes an object or action in a way that isn't literally true, but helps explain an idea or make a comparison. All right, and so it's very symbolic uh, when you talk about a metaphor. We all learn different ways, but perhaps you can look back at your life and, and know that you've been impacted or you've learned a concept by a metaphor. My daughter right now, our oldest, is at an age where when she hears me use a word that's unknown to her, she asks, what does that mean? You can see the wheels turning in her head. And at times, it can be very difficult to find a way to describe to a five-year-old if, in, in, in a way that they understand, so you have to be very creative. And so I find myself with her giving many metaphors at times. What is that, Daddy? What does that mean? Well, it's kind of like, but there's only so many metaphors you can use princesses with and flowers and animals i'm learning Um, but they you still can you can find things that way metaphors have helped all of us at times understand something better and this is not the first time christ god the holy spirit in his word has used analogies and metaphors to help explain and teach a thought god told abraham his offspring would be like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. The soul longing for the Lord is compared to a deer yearning after water. The psalmist said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress. 
Jesus stated, I am the bread of life. Paul said the church is a body with many members. So it's a great way to explain and to teach the unsearchable knowledge, wisdom, and teachings of our God. And as Christ moves now to his next section of the sermon, we have to be careful as we work through this one message of the Lord that he gave on this mount. It's, it's called the Sermon on the Mount because he was in a high place and his followers were there. As he gave it, we have to be careful. We're cutting it up into sections. And it's the temptation or the, the problem when we cut things into sections is we sometimes lose the overall context. But all of this was a part of this message, this sermon. And so as you roll off the Beatitudes of persecution, you roll into this thought process, these metaphors that Christ gives here. Let's read them together, and then we'll spend some time with them this morning and see what Christ has for us. Would you stand with me if you're able to? Matthew chapter 5, let's begin in verse 13 and read a few verses for our next section. And this morning, we're going to be looking at a section that um, I've entitled Metaphors for Making a Difference. Verse 13, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is hence, thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. You may be seated. Perhaps you know these metaphors well. Perhaps this is a part of the Sermon on the Mount that we've heard often. These specific metaphors, they are rich, they are pointed, they are practical, they are understandable, they are comprehensible, they are divine descriptions of those who are kingdom citizens, those who are in Christ. Salt and light. Both items that the audience to Christ's message would understand and they would know. Now, if you're like me, I come to this passage with some presuppositions because I've heard it many times. I really thought at times that both metaphors are another way of saying the same thing. And in general, that is true. Both metaphors are telling us that we are an impact on the world. But each metaphor alludes to a different way in which we are in impact to the world. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Christ says, you, that term ye, right? He's talking to his disciples. It's not just the apostles and the twelve called. This is for us. Ye are the salt of the earth. Let's look at this first analogy, this first metaphor together. Ye are the salts of the earth. We find it pretty much summed up in verse 13. To fully understand this metaphor and what Christ is getting at in this description of his disciples, we must understand what this salt, or the Greek term is alas, meant to the one sitting there at the foot of Christ. That's important for context here. Salt was used for many things. In fact, it was even used for payments around this time. Could you imagine uh, getting paid in a, in a small thing, a small bag of salt or something like that? Roman soldiers, history actually states, were at times paid with salt. And if a Roman soldier did not do their job, we get the phrase that's not used as quite as much today, but maybe you've heard it, they were not worth their salt. That's where that phrase came from. Salt's been used for a payment method. But we have many uses for salt, do we not? What are some of those uses? Let's talk about those uses, and then let's think, what is Christ referring to here? Salt was one of the most important staples of any economy in ancient times. It was not only viewed as a sign of prosperity, along with wine and oil, but as a necessity for survival. There was a rabbinic saying, the world cannot survive without salt. You can still find that in, in uh, rabbinic writings. 
in the hot, dry, and windy climate of uh, the east, bodies, uh, body salts, electrolytes, they're quickly lost with perspiration and need to be maintained unless dehydration occurs. In biblical times, salt was recognized as a necessity of life. Salt was so valuable in the New Testament times that, again, Roman soldiers were often paid their wages in salt. Also, uh, another use, and we're going to talk more about this in a moment, is uh, because of lack of refrigeration as we know it today, meat would spoil almost immediately without salt. So it was both a preservative and a seasoning agent to add flavor to food. Salt was taken from the Dead Sea or dug from the marsh areas, and this meant it was often impure and mingled with vegetable and earth substance like gypsum. And if the gypsum was in sufficient quantities, the salt became alkaline and uh, would lose its salty character, its savor and effect because of this contamination. In Palestine, flakes of salt uh, form on the rock shores of the Dead Sea at night. And in the morning, with the rise of the sun, the salt loses its saltiness because of the heat. Of course, salt also kills vegetation. And in areas where salt exists, vegetation is oftentimes sparse. So there are many uses of salt in our world. In fact, there are not only many uses of salt in our world, there's actually many references to salt in Scripture. And this is where we have to be careful to understand what Christ is saying here because in Scripture, even the different uses of salt are described. As a result of these conditions, salt came to be used in several ways, many of which became illustrations or symbols of spiritual principles. In some passages, because vegetation will not grow in salt, It was used as a symbol of desolation and barrenness. You can find that in Jeremiah 17 and verse 6, Zephaniah 2 and verse 9, Deuteronomy 29 and verse 23, Psalm 107 and verse 34. Salt was used to refer to desolation and barrenness. Because salt was a necessary ingredient in any meal as a seasoning agent, it could symbolize uh, seasoning and its seasoning pack, right? Let your uh, speech be always with grace seasoned with salt, right? We have that in Scripture as well. As a preservative, salt hinders the decay or spoiling of food. It became a symbol of preservation. As a seasoning agent, it seasons, uh, gives flavor. It makes food more palatable and enjoyable. As a source of body or electrolytes, it creates thirst. And in Matthew uh, chapter 5 and verse 13 here, some would say that that is being alluded to here. But to understand the use of symbolism here, I believe we first must understand the second part of the phrase. Ye are the salt of the earth. The literal statement that Christ makes is that you are the halas of the geese, or land, is what that Greek term is. It it would be a phrase that would say you are the salt of the little ground, right? That's really what it means. And we can't can't say, all right, it's, it's the same term as world, you're the light of the world, because they're two different terms. So the metaphor that Christ gives is you you are like the salt, what it is to land, what it is to the earth in that way. And that's what the literal, literal interpretation of that would be. Our modern main use of salt is not the same as the main use of salt in this time when the audience was hearing Christ state these words. Perhaps our main use for salt is for seasoning. Some of you have to have salt on your salt, right? Some of you have to have salt before you've even tasted the food. I never understood that, um, how you know it needs more salt without tasting it. When something is salted correctly, though, it does greatly enhance the flavor of it, does it not? And uh, so in that way, I do enjoy salt, um, enhancing the flavor of my food. That's perhaps the main use of it today. But we have to think biblically, we have to think culturally and contextually here. 
the main use of salt when Christ said these words to the audience, the main use they used it for was for preservation. That is, they did not have refrigeration like we have it today. They would maybe use caves on occasion or something like that. But their use of preserving meat was to pile salt on it so that meat would not spoil, that it would not uh, that it would spoil at a slower rate, you might say, or that it would preserve it in that way. That was the main use of salt in that time. And from that, and from that phrase, you are the salts of the earth, scholars agree, and I would agree and take this position as well, that is what Christ is alluding to, the preserving qualities of salt. Now don't get me wrong, there are other elements of salt that we can apply to the Christian life right? Seasoning our speech with salt. And perhaps all of them could fall under this general term. Um, but if, if, if you're anything like me, I have at times heard messages that when you get to this metaphor, it means anything and everything about salt. And that's not quite correct, all right? Just because salt does this does not mean that that's what Jesus was saying in a metaphor here. And so for those reasons of the phrase, the salt on the earth, and also the main use of salt in that time, um, I think that you will find that probably 90% of scholars would agree Christ is alluding to the preserving qualities of salt in this metaphor. Ye are the salt of the earth. Ye are to be like a preservative. You see, the presence of believers should slow down the rate of decay. That is the metaphor here. You would think, and so Christ commanded, that believers' presence, those who are in Christ, those who live in the world as citizens, but are ultimately kingdom citizens, they would work as a preserver in morality. We all understand this morning that the world is not getting better and better, right? It's getting darker and darker. It's getting worse and worse. And that's what happens without Christ. Everything is moving towards decay. Everything is moving towards moral corruption. Myers puts it this way, a figure of the power, uh, this metaphor, which counteracts corruption and preserves in a sound condition the effect which salt has upon water, like in 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 20, meat and other things. Thus, the ministry of the disciples was destined by the communication of the divine truth to oppose the spiritual corruption and the powerlessness of men and to be the means of bringing about their moral soundness and power of life. You see, as Christ preaches this message and He describes kingdom citizens beautifully in the Beatitudes, He now looks at His people who are in a dying and a corrupt world and He says, you need to understand something. You are the salt of the earth. If my followers, if my kingdom citizens cannot be in this world amongst people a bright spot of preserving morality and preserving righteousness, then it's just going to move faster and faster towards corruption, morally speaking. Spiritually speaking. That is what Christ is stating here. If we follow the kingdom handbook, conforming to kingdom norms, and as one writer says, we will be a moral disinfectant in a world where moral standards are low, where moral standards are constantly changing or non-existent. And we will greatly benefit the world by the good deeds we do. You are the salt of the earth, a preservative, a flavor enhancer as you follow the teachings of Jesus, pursuing good deeds and personal purity. You make this world a much better place to live, even in society. So then the meaning is this, you disciples are the agent in this earth working to preserve from total corruption and spoil. As the world gets worse and worse, Christ is saying my people ought to be the salt of morality, of righteousness, of holiness. If anything in this earth should work to push things back to goodness and back to morality and back to pleasing God, it should be His people. And when God's people, as His chosen line of preserving holiness and morality, fail, the result is more spoiling, 
more decay. You've been chosen as God's instruments to preserve morality and righteousness. The church is expected to be of the same character. That is, we're not just to be merely pure. We're to purify. Not just the apostles. We looked at the context last week. Those who are in Christ. You and I this morning. But the metaphor didn't stop there, right? What else did Christ state in verse 13? which also gives context to this preservation meaning. If the salt, the alas, has lost its savor, its morenthi is the Greek, how can it be made salty? Salt that has lost its distinctive qualities is here said to lack its proper sense or its proper mind. That's what losing its savor would be. So salt without its sharpness is uh, or without its virtue, salt losing its virtue, is said is thenceforth good for nothing. It's wholly useless. It's left to be thrown out of doors and trampled on by men as no more than common dirt in the streets. It's worthless. And that's the comparison here with the disciples the worthless, and the contemptible. My disciples will be even in the most eminent stations if you lose your character for real and vital religion here. The, um, the, the passage here is, is really alluding um, to that, that metaphor still of salt. Uh, Mundrell uh, has a quote by Dr. McKnight and illustrates our Lord's supposition of salt losing its savor. In the Valley of Salt near Gabal, and about four hours' journey from Aleppo, there is a small precipice occasioned by the continual taking away of the salt. In this, he says, you may see how the veins of it lie. I break a piece off of it, of which the part that was exposed to the rain and the sun and the air Though it had the sparks and the particles of salt, it had perfectly lost its savor. The innermost part at times would have still had some if it had been connected to the rock. That perhaps would retain its savor. And this is what Christ is saying. What good is it? Just to be stepped on and walked on, it has no use but to be trampled by foot of men. The idea isn't, please be salt. It is, you are salt. The only question is whether you're salty. Not in the modern use of salty, like grumpy, um, how some people use it, right? You are the salt of the earth. Not, please be salt for the earth. You are. The question is, have you lost your savor? Have you lost that impact? You see, believer, you state to be in Christ, but if you fail to live like one who is in Christ, what good are you really doing for the preserving of morality and the preserving of righteousness? What good is your profession if your life is not preserving morality, but rather compromising and stepping over morality into immorality? I'm afraid we have churches full of a loss, salt, without its flavor without its savor, without its saltiness. And we've produced a church and Christian culture that is not producing fruit for the Lord. Rather, we failed to preserve and have added to the rate of decay. How sad when you are in Christ. This is what you are to be. That's the first analogy. That's the first metaphor. We'll come back to applying that here in a moment. What's the second metaphor. It's similar, but it's a little different, correct? Verse 14, the second metaphor, ye are the salt of the earth and ye are the light of the world. It's another great metaphor, one that adds to what Christ desires his followers, those kingdom citizens to be, the light of the world. It's kind of an interesting metaphor because Christ refers to himself, right, as the light of the world in John chapter 1 and in John chapter 8. 
Webster defines light as something which enables you to see or that which makes vision possible. In other words, light and sight go together. But this means you must have some kind of instrument that can use the light so the vision is possible, like an eye. Matthew 6.22 says, uh, the lamp of the body, the instrument of light, is the eye. So this, that very simple definition does not really explain light scientifically, right? That's a whole other discussion if you are a science teacher and know anything about light and the study of light and what it is, right? That's a deep um, a rabbit hole, if you will. But the basic definition of light gives us an understanding of this metaphor, right? It does point uh, to the key issue and meaning of light. So because of light, man can see the world around him and all of its brilliance and colors and details, assuming his eyes are functional. Light is a means of vision, for without it, no matter how good your eyes, we could see nothing. But without eyes, no matter how good the light, right, you can also see nothing. So after using the figure of salt to express the a function of the subjects of his kingdoms in the world, the Lord said to the disciples, you are the light of the world. So what was he saying? How could the disciples be the light of the world? By application, since this applies to us, how can we be the light of the world? We can obviously get the general gist of this, but to better grasp this truth or let it grasp us, we, uh, we looked at the use of light um, in Scripture and, and other places, light and darkness analogy is common in Scripture, correct? Um, and we have that analogy throughout. The effect of light being, light being uh, to make things manifest, Ephesians 5 says, and to direct us in the way in which we are to walk. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. The importance of this metaphor is that Christ had appointed his disciples in general and his apostles and other ministers of the gospel in particular to enlighten and to reform the world that was immersed in ignorance and sin and misery by their example and by their doctrine. And so to direct their feet into the way leading to life and salvation, Christ, it needs to be observed, is in the highest sense the light of the world. The original light, the great light, that is, you cannot be the metaphorical light of the world here without being in the true light of the world, without being in Christ. If you want a passage on what it looks like to be light, I believe Ephesians defines it well. If you want to turn over to Ephesians chapter 5, this is Paul, in essence, kind of um, under the inspiration of God, giving a commentary on what it means to be the light of the world. Ephesians chapter 5, look down at verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. So whatsoever doth not doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. I think that's a beautiful explanation of what it means to be the light of the world. Light is indeed a reflective from the light of Christ and a revealing work. So salt is a preserving work. Light is a revealing work. It reflects the true light of Christ and it shines light and it reveals the darkness. But the metaphor kind of has two smaller analogies to it, does it not? Look down at verses 14 and 15. Once again, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill, cannot be hid. What does that say to us? Right, a hill elevates anything placed on it, like a city. It elevates it to the view of everyone around it. It makes it stand out. It's clearly visible, which of course is the function of light. And again, Webster defines something which enables you to see. In other words, light and sight, they again go together. 
It's written, uh, this is written in some historical documents. One who travels the Holy Land is impressed with the fact that multitudes of villages were built on the top of hills. When night came, the light in the houses on the hill could not be hidden. From a great distance, one knew the location of the next village because of the light from that hilltop. In other words, the cities became a beacon for travelers who could literally travel from city to city by the light of those cities. When we are truly Christian, when we are in Christ, when we abide in Him who is the light and experience His life and character in ours, it elevates us and makes us distinct in the sense of more visible. It is something which cannot hide. It becomes obvious to all around. You can't hide a real relationship with Jesus Christ. You cannot hide when you are in Christ to the world around you. Of course, this is the issue. Are we really walking with Christ? Or is our relationship very superficial? City said on a hill. What's the other analogy underneath this larger metaphor of a light of the world? A candle, right? That is put under a bushel. Why does anyone light a lamp but to see? Obviously, it's done so it may give off light to a room. A man does not light a lamp which is designed to give light to, its, uh, to the habitation of the house and then put it under something that hides that light, a container that will snuff out the light. That would be ridiculous beyond measure is the metaphor here. You are in Christ. You are in the light of the world. And that is... That means you are a new creature. You are the light of the world. In in so much you reflect Christ. Why would someone be the light of the world in the light of the world and put that light out so that no one else could see? It's absurd. It's ridiculous. Yet that's exactly what the believer can do with his or her life. God has made us to be lamps in Jesus Christ and he left us here in the world that we might give off the light of the glory of Jesus Christ. It's the children's song. This little light of mine, right? I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. So what are we? If we have done this, if we hide our light, well, it's kind of similar. It's rhetorical to salt that has lost its savor, light that's hid or put under a bushel. It's really good for nothing. Like salt, which has lost its savor. We become ridiculous for what we are wasting our very purpose for living as the children of God. In this passage, Christ teaches us that those who believe in Him are the light of the world, but we must remember that we can function as such only because of our essential relationship to Him. He alone is the true light of the world since He is God, the source of light, and the Logos, the revelation of God. So with this picture, He seeks to get us to face our purpose and our function as His people, to let our light shine. But we can do this only to the degree that we receive light from Jesus Christ, who is to us what you might say the sun is to the moon, or what a match is to an oil-soaked wick in a lamp. Our true responsibility is to reveal the Lord Jesus, to give off the light of His glorious light. You see, friend, if you are in Christ, you are more than trying to slow down the rate of decay, salt, with your life. You are to reflect Christ. You are to reveal man's greatest need and share the light of the Savior. It gives light to all who are in the house. It goes from a description of what kingdom citizens are to a command. Did you catch that? Ye are this, ye are this, here's the command, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Let's draw some applications as we kind of wrap up this morning, okay? Two great metaphors, analogies that are really helpful, but did you notice verse 16? Let your light so shine before men. Why? That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. 
The second verb points us to the ultimate purpose of seeing our good works. There is to be a specific goal behind displaying our good works. But this means more than just seeing our good works. What I mean by that is the result that God wants is that men might, through these good works, come to glorify Him. And this means drawing them to Jesus Christ because they have seen Him as the source and the means of good works or of a life which is different and dynamic. God is glorified when men accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. This means the way we display our light or the good works is very crucial. It could be done in such a way that men ultimately come to know that our light is Jesus Christ. That the means of our good works is not us, but God's grace in Jesus Christ within us. So again, as we rub shoulders with men, we must somehow communicate with them that Jesus Christ is the one who makes our lives different. We need to look for opportunities in our conversation to include biblical truths to show that our faith is the reason for how we live and what we do. Life is filled with those opportunities, but they too often get unused, and our light, our character as a reflection of Jesus Christ, gets pushed under a tub or a bushel. People often can see a difference, but they never find out that that difference is Jesus Christ. Do you see a problem with that? Eagle Heights, you're not just called to be different. I would, I would suspect if, if you asked people in our community if Eagle Heights people are different, they'd probably say yes. That's not the point. They ought to know why. Those good works are for a reason, to point them back to Christ. That is the, the product. That is the result. They think we are differently, different simply because We are one of the nice guys. We get the credit and not God, so He's not glorified. I'm telling you, believer, the time has been too long that believers, you know, whether we call ourselves, whether it's Baptist or not, I I know we struggle in our camp. The time has been too long that believers, where the world sees a difference, but they never quite make the connection to Christ. That's a problem. Because we are not just different. We are Christ-like. That's what the world needs to know. The world doesn't need to say, oh yeah, Eagle Heights, they are different because they believe some weird stuff. They're they're different because they want to stand out. They are different because this or that. It should be clear to the world we are different because of Christ. And if if we cannot connect those two, our difference really does not matter. It does not matter if Eagle Heights is different if we're not connecting it to Christ. The motive to publicity is the direct opposite of the temper which led the Pharisees to his prayers and almsgiving. Not to be seen of men and win their praise, but to win men through our use of the light which we know to be not our own and to glorify the giver of the light. It ultimately is a witness. They see you, not just hear you, right? That's what he says. That they may hear, that they may see your good works. I mean, this is, this is simply put, and I think we know this this morning. Christ is saying this, you are in Christ, you are kingdom citizens, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. When you walk through life, being in Christ, it preserves, it reveals, it reflects by nature. You don't have to go pounding down somebody's door. You don't have to scream and shine the flashlight in somebody's face and point out all their conditions of sin. Be like Christ. By nature, And all of those beatitudes, blessed are the pure, poor in spirit, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are they that mourn. When you are in Christ and that is your nature, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. 
in so much as it reflects Jesus Christ. The idea of light is not in this passage as an investigating flashlight, but a light that shines before men, that reveals their surroundings and points the way and shows true life and shows true joy and shows true peace like a city on a hill that people can't ignore your light because it's stationary and visible for them to see. Hear me out for a moment. We have treated being the light of the world like it means for us to get out and just condemn sinners. That is not, ye are the light of the world. You're awful. Well, we all are. Lights of the world are not judges. They are just that, lights. And only lights because of Christ. Because without Christ, my friend, you are no light. You would still be living in darkness. We were sometimes in darkness. But because of Jesus Christ, there's any light in our life. Light is reflecting Christ and remembering that He came, John 3.17, into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That's what it means. That's who He is. He didn't call us to be the light of the world and say, all right, disciples, apostles, I'm making you the judges of all mankind. He can't do that because we're not perfect. Only God can. Only Jesus Christ could look at a Pharisee and say those things. We are all in the same boat. The only way we can be the light of the world is if we're in the light of Christ. If we've accepted Him as our personal Lord and Savior. Metaphors to challenge the citizens to live certain ways and have certain effects on the earth and the world around them. And as a result, those disciples, being salt and light, are also being witnesses of Christ as they preserve righteousness, as they reveal true life in Christ. What you have in these very simple four verses is the picture that our Lord gives of the Christian in the world, the function of the believer in the world. And if I could reduce it down to one word, it would be the word influence. You are influences for me in the world. Our Lord is saying that the Christian who lives according to the Beatitudes is going to influence the world as salt and as light. And all that a person does and that a person is or is not, the sum total of our character consciously or otherwise, affects other people. Philosophers have put it this way, no man is an island. One of my favorite stories out of Greek mythology, and that's what it is, mythology, right, is recorded by Dr. Peter Wolf in a rather old book, and this is what he says. The story is told in mythology of a goddess who came unseen but was always known by the blessings she left in her pathway. Trees that were blackened by forest fires put forth new leaves as she passed by. In her footprints at the brookside, violets sprang up. The stagnant pool became a spring of sparkling water. The parched fields blossomed as The rose and every hillside and valley blushed with new life and beauty when she passed. The story is also told of another beautiful princess who was sent as a present to a particular king. About her was an atmosphere as sweet-smelling as the garments of Aphrodite. She seemed as beautiful and as pure as if fresh from a bath of dew, and her breath was a sweet perfume of the richest rose. But strange enough, in the atmosphere that she carried about with her was the contagion of death. From her infancy, this beautiful woman had known no food but poison. She had been reared on it and had become so permeated with it that she herself became the very essence of it. She would breathe her fragrant breath into a swarm of insects, and behold, they lie dead at her feet. She would place the loveliest flower upon her bosom, and lo, it would fade and fall apart. Into her presence came a hunging bird, and it fluttered and poised a moment, shuddered and fell dead. That's the short gist of the story of Dr. Beterwolf. And how like this poisoned princess is every man whose influence is a blight, whose influence is a curse upon his fellow man. 
That's the moral of his story. We live, says Peter Wolf, in the atmosphere we exhale that's richly laden with the fragrance of virtue or with a poisonous con- uh, perfume that consumes the people around us. In a much more eloquent and perfect manner, Christ put it this way, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. And that makes a difference. That makes an impact when the light of Christ is flowing through you. He's talking about influence. He's talking about how you and I affect the world. And in the Sermon on the Mount, at this point, he is saying, you who are characterized by the Beatitudes, the, that quality of life, you who are the sons and daughters of the kingdom, are the salt and the light of the world to influence the world for good and for God. Our Lord is calling on us to influence the world we live in just as he, he was those disciples that were gathered with him as he preached to the multitude. G. Campbell Morgan says, Jesus, looking out over the multitude of his day, saw the corruption of life at every point. He saw its spoilation, and because of his love of the multitudes, he knew the thing they needed most was salt in order that that corruption would be arrested. And he saw them wrapped in gloom, sitting in darkness, groping amidst fogs and mist, and he knew that they needed, above everything else, light. The presupposition here is that we live in a decaying and dark and darkening world. Jesus reveals his perspective on the world. It's decayed and it's dark. Another application, we ask ourselves this often, so what is the believer's relationship to the world? We're to be in the world, not of the world. What does that mean? Right? What is that perspective? I believe this passage and passages like this are important for believers when we balance living in the world but not being of the world. What does it mean? Well, the metaphor of light eliminates that it means isolation. Be in the world, not of the world, does not mean God has called us to pull ourselves away from every person, from every worldly influence, from everything that smells of the stench of the world and isolate ourselves. No, light, that metaphor, that eliminates that that's what God wants us to do. Because it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men. So the light analogy, it eliminates isolation, but the salt analogy it eliminates the opposite end of the spectrum, which is integration. To just, let's do everything the world is doing for the sake of the gospel. Let, let's sin so that it's, it's more appealing to their eyes. Let's do this even though it's not pleasing to the Lord. The answer of being believers in salt and light, it eliminates isolation, but it also eliminates integration. God did not call us in Christ to live like the world. God did not call us to put on the works of darkness now that we are in the light. So our relationship with the world is not isolation. It's not integration. But it is, I just need an I word, interest. It is taking interest. It is impacting. Taking interest in the world to the point that it leaves a lasting impact everything a believer is supposed to be should impact the world for Christ. So then when we are not impacting the world for Christ, we are unfortunately the ones to blame, not Christ. Not our message, but our own walk. This is who you are. Don't hide your light and put it out by unbecoming deeds. Don't lose your saltiness and decline morally yourself. What good is is Christ followers in a world where we cannot stand for morality and preserve righteousness? What What good are Christ followers in the world when we cannot share what He has done in our life and reflect it in our living and reflect who He is? And I would remind you that we do often use this passage as a witnessing passage, and it is. But the passage at its bulk is that they may see you. Not necessarily here. That they see you who are kingdom citizens, who are poor in spirit, who are mourners, who are pure in heart, who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness, who, yes, those things sometimes cause persecutions when you are in Christ. 
But when you live that way, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. They are metaphors for making a difference. So as we conclude this morning, believer, these metaphors are beautifully placed in a sermon by the greatest preacher to ever walk this earth, to ever exist, Jesus Christ, following poetically describing who kingdom citizens are in the Beatitudes. He gives us two metaphors for us to understand not just who we are, but what we should be doing. In a few verses, he's now going to direct their attention to the Mosaic Law. I know you're all interested in that because Christ defined it more perfectly and purely in this Sermon on the Mount. We'll get to that section. But before he even gets to that, the whole Sermon on the Mount is to those who are in Christ. That is, you and I, we cannot live Matthew 5 through Matthew 7 unless you are in Christ. It's impossible. You cannot live the Beatitudes. You cannot be the salt of the earth and the light of the world unless you are in Christ. Is there a time, friend, that you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? We'd love to tell you about the forgiveness of Christ. We pray that as we walk in His light, it's clear to others that we are different because of Him that we're not just different, that we're Christ-like. Believer, is that your testimony this morning? As you look at these two metaphors, you're the salt of the earth. Perhaps you're here this morning, and when it comes to preserving righteousness and morality in the workplace, unfortunately, you haven't really acted as salt. Maybe the things that you've chose humor in, the the, the things that you've chosen to discuss, the things that you've chosen to do would do the opposite of preserve morality in a declining and decaying world. That's not who we are in Christ. That's not who Christ desires us to be. When you are the salt of the earth, we we live differently. And in those moments, we are to remember who we are in Christ. Remember what He has commanded to us, what He would have us to do. Christ, in his perfect knowledge, he said, said, you know how I want to spread my message? Put fallen people who are in me, who are in Christ, in workplaces that are decaying and that are dark and that are sinful. That they could look and see from those who are in Christ the answer. That they could look and see a difference and they could look and see hope and true joy and true peace and true satisfaction and true morality. And yet, when we have lost our Savior, what good is someone in Christ in the workplace who is not willing to be moral? Who is not willing to live righteously and with integrity? What good is lights in the world if we put it under a bushel? And our light is not for others to see the Christ-like spirit that we have, the Christ-like actions that we have. And yes, going along with that is our words of the gospel and what it means to be in Christ. And so that is where the, the metaphor of salt being a seasoning agent does come in because to be the light of the world, people seeing your good works, part of what they see is speech <laughs> seasoned with grace and salt. Is that you? Maybe the Lord is stirring in your heart this morning and saying, this is what I desire you to be. If you are in Christ, if you are a kingdom citizen, the salt of the earth, you're a preserving agent in the decaying world, and you're the light of the world. You're a revealing and a reflective age, agent in a dark and dying world. And when we fail to live as we should, we fail to have that effect. We really become useless to those purposes. Not sure about you this morning. My prayer here at Eagle Heights Baptist Church is that we would be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. But we can only do that in so much as we reflect Christ. We can only do that as individuals in the workplace and in the world being a preserving agent to righteousness and morality and being in our community and our world a revealing and a reflective agent of the light of Jesus Christ. The goal moving forward and the goal in our history is not that we just be different. It's not just to win people to be a disciple of Eagle Heights. 
is to win people to Christ. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And the most glorifying act to him is when a soul places their faith and trust in him. That is our job. The Beatitudes, this is who you are. The illustrations or the metaphors next in his sermon, this is what you should be doing. And that's what the bulk of his sermon is going to be about. Do this, this is what that means, and this is how we should be behaving that way. But for this morning, can we all pray and ask the Lord to do a work in our hearts, God, that you would use me, you'd use us as a church, as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your perfect word and your perfect teaching. Lord, you know exactly how to put truths and in an allegorical and metaphorical way you have put these truths that your followers are to be like salt is to the earth and light is to the world and their effects. That's what you desire for us. And Lord, as we reflect on that, And we see the results and the motivation of that, that others see you through our life. Lord, we pray that you would reveal areas in our life today where we have not appropriately been salt of the earth or light to the world. That you'd change us in those areas. That you'd push us and that we would be willing to become more like Christ and more spirit-led on a daily basis so that those things are a product in our life and radiating through us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me with your head bowed and eyes closed for just a moment? Look, if you've had a Bible for any amount of time, if you've been saved for any amount of time, there are probably metaphors that you've heard. You're the light of the world, the salt of the earth. We've looked briefly at what it means to be those two things. Now it's time not just to hear, but to search our own hearts, to ask the Lord to search our hearts. He does a much better job than you and I searching our hearts this morning. So as the piano is going to quietly play here in a moment, may I ask that you allow the Lord to search your heart, to try your actions, to try your motives, to try those things, that God would have his way in our hearts, that Christ would be permeating through our lives, that these things would truly be true of we who are in him, of us as a church and us as individuals. So however the Lord is speaking to your heart, The uh, the altar's open, take business and deal with those things as as you see fit and the Lord is prompting you. And uh, we'll spend some time speaking to him as the piano quietly plays. Amen. You can look up this way. Appreciate you all. Thanks for being here this morning. It's good to see you all. Let us know if you need anything this afternoon. We will be back at 6 p.m. in our study on Leviticus. And uh, the teenagers are, I hope you know this, teenagers, you're singing tonight. And uh, I know you do. I've heard you practicing. So looking forward to all of that time together, worshiping the Lord once again. If you're able to make it, um, we're looking forward to doing that once again. You are dismissed.